Since I'm at a university, I thought I really ought to start with a, a pop quiz. But you shouldn't worry. There's only one question on this quiz, and it will not count on your final exam. So what I'm going to do is read you a quote. And your job is to guess when that was written. What, it's from a report. deals with Whatcom County, and you decide when it was written. These water resource challenges include limited water supplies to meet current and future needs, water quality degradation, the resolution of tribal federal reserved water rights and related tri treaty based claim claims, and endangered species listings for Chinook salmon and bull trout. Left unresolved, these issues will have a broad and far reaching effect on the economic, social, and environmental health of the Whatcom County community. Okay. Who wants to guess when that report was written? I told you it doesn't matter. It's not, you know, <laughs> guess whatever you want. <laughs> Somebody. In the 60s. In the 60s, okay. Before you were born. Yes. yes. Last week. Last week. Well, that kind of covers a broad range. <laughs> <laughs> well, the sad thing is this was uh, from a report in 2005, the uh, Nooksack River Basin Watershed Management Plan. And it's kind of an interesting document to go back 24 years and read this plan and see how remarkably little, little has been accomplished uh, since then. So I'm going to talk about uh, these water supply and demand issues uh, and give you my sense of, why, of the kinds of problems I think we face and uh, what's not being done about it and why. Before I do that, you should know that there are a lot of smart people in this county who've got a lot more experience than I do who disagree with pretty much everything I say. But since they're not here, we can just assume that they're wrong. <laughs> well, my main pitch, in case you have to leave early or you decide to take a nap, is that water is a scarce resource. For decades, for centuries, for eons, we have treated water as if it was inexhaustible, infinite. Well, it's not. It is especially scarce in the summer when we have low flows in the streams and very little rain. And ironically, at that time, we have very high demand, mostly for irrigation, mostly for agriculture. Fortunately, there are many options to improve stream flows, both on the supply side, that is finding somehow or other more water or moving it around to where it's needed most, or the part that I am most interested in, which is reducing demand. As, as Stefan said, uh, my background is primarily in energy efficiency, which I found over decades is a really powerful resource, and I think the same thing is true for water use efficiency. Several projects have been completed and underway, and I think overall they're positive, but we don't really have any kind of an overall strategy uh, to really solve problems and help restore uh, salmon runs. And I personally think that the county should take leadership. Um, Jack Lowes, the county executive, disagrees. Well, he and I have never talked about that, but just by watching his actions, he disagrees. And I don't really blame him. I'll come to that, back to that. So before I get into the details, let's talk a little bit about the geography. What are we talking about? So the main river in Whatcom County is the Nooksack River, and the blue area here is the hydrogeological basin. Uh, at the east, by Mount Baker, it includes the north, middle, and south forks of the Nooksack River, which come together to form the main stem, which then flows into a Bellingham Bay around here. And you also have, uh, from an administrative point of view, from a regulatory point of view, the State Department of Ecology has defined what's called WIRA 1, Water Resource Inventory Area Number 1. You will definitely want to use the term WIRA at the next cocktail party you go to. It will just really snow people how much you know. And that includes more than uh, the basin. It includes uh, parts of the county to the west, including Bellingham, that are not inside the watershed, but are administrative part of WIRA 1. And notice that the South Fork, whoops. Not that button. OK, yeah. I'm great at pushing the wrong button. OK, this one. So part of the Nooksack is in uh, Skagit County. And part of the administrative uh, WIRA 1, for some reason, is in Canada. I don't know why that is. Well, people who say that Whatcom County has lots of water are correct. But they're really talking about the amount of water we have on an annual average basis. We get, depending on where in the county you are, 40 to 100 inches a year. Uh, in, the, in the mountains, we get snow. Uh, during the winter, and then that is kind of a reservoir that releases water in the spring and the summer, either as snow melt or glaciers melting. In addition, we have a large aquifer that underlies the northern part of the county, the Sumas Abbotsford Aquifer. And unlike some parts of the West where we're mining aquifers, that is year over year, the water table is dropping. Here, the water table drops during the summer, 
<clears throat> but then when the rains come in the winter, the water table comes back up. So our quantity issues are seasonal in that we have very low stream flows in the summer and very little rain, and as I said before, uh, lots of water use. Well, why does it matter? Who cares about uh, water? Uh, well, salmon and wildlife, uh, other wildlife suffer from low summer flows because the lower the flow, the higher the water temperature, and fish like cold, clear water. There's less dissolved oxygen. They need oxygen to breathe. There's also less habitat. If, if the water level keeps dropping, there's less volume that they can work in. And if it drops too far, they can't move upstream or downstream. They're kind of blocked by uh, the morphology of the river. I love that word, morphology. I have no idea what it means, but it's a great word. <laughs> uh, the State Department of Ecology in 1985 issued an in-stream flow rule that set minimum levels for something like 30 to 50 points in the Nooksack River Basin. Uh, by and large, in the summer, we're not meeting those uh, minimum flow levels. And as a consequence, salmon and other fish are doing poorly. And Chinook salmon, steelhead, and bull trout are all listed as threatened under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And as I'm sure you've all read in the papers, the uh, southern resident orca is doing very poorly. And the primary reason is that they're starving. And the reason they're starving is there are not enough Chinook salmon, which is what they eat. Unfortunately, I think these problems will get worse unless we make dramatic changes. Two reasons why the problems will get worse. One is population growth. Whatcom County is a popular, popular place to live, and our population is growing at about 2% a year. I think a bigger factor is uh, climate change. And I'm not talking about what might happen in the future. I'm going to talk a little bit about what has been happening over the last 30, 40 years. And the historical data and therefore the future trends, I think, are pretty ominous. It's remarkable. I'm a pretty upbeat guy. <laughs> so this uh, chart shows uh, the extent to which uh, we've met the e ecology in-stream flow rule for the Nooksack River at Ferndale. And you can see that in the summer, uh, we're not doing very well. So July, August, September, October also, we are very likely to have flows that fall below what ecology determined as the minimum levels. Two additional points. One is it's not just whether we're meeting the level or not, it's how far below it are we falling. If the level is 1,500 cubic feet a second and the actual flow is 1,499, that's not bad. But if it's only 1,000 cubic feet a second, well, that 400 cubic feet a second deficit is pretty serious. And unfortunately, the deficit is greatest during the summer months also. So during that period, we both are most likely to not meet the standard and we're most likely to fall well below the standard. To make things even worse, about 20 years after ecology put out its rule, Utah State University did a whole bunch of work sort of revisiting this. And their suggested minimum stream flows are quite a bit higher than ecology's, roughly on average double. So according to the USU work, we're doing even worse. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, who uses water and when. The blue line shows my estimates of uh, total county water use for some time in the last few years. I don't know exactly when because the data are terrible, as we'll talk about in a little bit. And you can see that there's this big spike in the summer, especially in July and August. And that dashed line tells us why there's a spike in the summer. It's because of agricultural irrigation. If you drive out in the county, you will see lots of fields being irrigated, growing corn and hay to feed to cattle, or uh, blueberries, raspberries, and a little bit of strawberries. And that uses a lot of water. So if we're serious about uh, solving water issues in Whatcom County and getting more water into the creeks and the main stem river, we need to do something about agricultural irrigation, in my view. And what we really need to do is improve efficiency. I don't think anybody here wants to get rid of the farms. I think, on the contrary, we would like to preserve farmland and farms. We just need to make them more efficient. I mentioned that the data are of pretty poor quality. Well, in response to a 2003 state, uh, state law, every utility in the state, municipality, water district, water association, is required to meter every one of its customers. And the deadline for that was in, I think, 2017. So at this point, every residential, commercial, and industrial customer of a utility in the state is metered. Unfortunately, we have no public data on water use for agriculture or for what are called rural permit exempt wells. Uh, Stefan talked about the Hearst decision, which is really the Melius decision. She's the one who did all the work. Uh, and that dealt with rural permanent exempt wells. The uh, Supreme Court made 
I thought a terrific decision in October of 2016. Unfortunately, the state legislature 15 months later pretty much overturned that decision. So although Jean and her colleague Tim Trahimovich worked very hard and very effectively, uh, the politics uh, ultimately overwhelmed the decision. Uh, so while we've got all this data, it resides with each utility. So Bellingham, Linden, Ferndale, they each have their own data sets. Uh, the Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District, the Birch Bay Water and Sewer District, they also. And there's no entity that collects, organizes, analyzes, and reports results to the public. Stefan mentioned that you know, my work at Oak Ridge was uh, with the electricity industry. And there's tons of data on that. Uh, the Energy Information Administration, state energy offices, others publish data on a monthly basis on who uses electricity, how electricity is generated, how much. We don't have anything like that in water, which is stunning because if you think about it, water is really important. Well, I actually just said this. So we don't have data on agricultural irrigation and it is the most important use, especially during the summer. There are estimation methods, uh, analytical ways you can uh, approximate, estimate how much water is being used by irrigation, but they differ uh, dramatically from each other uh, by a factor of two. So here's our most important water use, and we don't know within plus or minus 50% how much they're actually using. So you know, again, this is why we would want to have uh, utility uh, data being analyzed. I mentioned that there are two key factors that are likely to affect future water use, population growth and climate change. Uh, I've looked at a number of factors over the last 30, 40 years to see what the trends are uh, because of time limitations. I'd really like to hear your comments and questions. I'm just going to show a, a couple of them. But uh, basically what we're seeing is higher demand because of population growth, less rainfall in the summer, and higher air temperatures in the summer. So those two factors increase the need for irrigation. And there's also, ironically, then lower flows because there's less rainfall and glacier mass has been shrinking. And let's look at a couple of these. So this shows um, summertime flows in the Nooksack River as measured at the gauge at Ferndale over the last, uh, since 1967 through uh, 27 to 2018, actually. And you can see it bounces around from year to year. In some years, we have more snow in the winter and therefore more flow in the summer. Other times it rains in the summer and some years it doesn't. So it really bounces around. But there is over this time period a trend. And the trend shows that flows are gradually going down by about 1% a year. Well, 1% is not really fast, but uh, you know, over time it is. The glaciers are kind of our bank. It's the storage system. It's our reservoir. And this chart shows that uh, glaciers are shrinking. And over the last 30 years or so, we've lost about 30% of, of the glaciers. Now, this applies to all of the North Cascades, not just to Mount Baker. But there's no reason to think that Mount Baker is uh, any different than uh, the rest of the Cascades. So things are grim, I think, and getting worse unless we do something about them. Well, we can improve in-stream flows with supply options or with demand options. I'm going to talk a little bit about both. So this slide lists some of the supply options. Uh, one possibility is to pump water from Ferndale. The public utility district uh, has uh, two intakes from the Nooksack River in Ferndale, and it also has a large water right far beyond what it actually uses. So it could, in principle, take more water out of the Nooksack uh, pump it north up towards the Canadian border, and then either put it into Bertrand Creek and Fishtrap Creek, or provide it directly to farmers and homes and, and others in the area. Of course, that would cost money. You'd have to put in place pipes and pumps and control systems, and then you'd have to operate the system, which would you know, cost money also. And so far, no one stepped up to do that. Uh, farmers have uh, switched from surface water to groundwater, which can help. If, if you have a stream here and you have a well here a couple hundred feet away and you're taking water out of the well instead of out of the creek, well, the, it will, will have an effect on the creek because groundwater and surface water are interconnected, but there'll be a delay. And how much of a delay depends on the nature of the aquifer and how far away from the stream you are. But uh, it could be helpful to uh, shift from surface to groundwater. A related option that uh, the farmers have tried a little bit with is if their irrigation ends, say, in uh, mid-September or late September, there's still a few weeks where it would be helpful to have more water in the creeks. So instead of pumping up water from their well and using it to irrigate, they could pump it up and put it into the stream. And they did a test 
um, I guess it was almost two years ago in Bertrand Creek, and it worked. Uh, so it's possible, but there's very limited data, and there's some issues with uh, water quality on that. Uh, the Birch Bay Water and Sewer District got money from the Department of Ecology to drill some test wells way to the west, outside of the, hyd the hydraulic or hydrogeology portion of the Nooksack River, uh, into a deep aquifer, four or five hundred feet deep. And they found uh, abundant water of high quality, which they could pump up and then move east into the Nooksack Basin. For example, sell it to Linden, um, because Linden has a growing population using a lot of water and doesn't have enough water rights to serve its demand. Unfortunately, most of these proposals lack details on their costs, the amount of water they provide, their locations, and in particular, cost effectiveness. You know, if I wanted to uh, do something about things on the supply side and people came to me with a bunch of projects, the first thing I want to know is, well, what is it going to cost per acre foot? And I start with the cheapest projects. Uh, but we don't know that. And I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the Blaine project because it looks like there really is a lot of water there. It's not hydraulically connected to the Nooksack River, so it's appealing, but we have no idea what it's going to cost. So, so let's talk a little bit about the demand side. <clears throat> oh, yeah, let me say something about the ecology uh, grant. So uh, they drilled three wells. The first one didn't show much, but the second and third wells did provide a lot of water and it was high quality. Uh, well, I've actually said all this. I should follow my slides a little bit better. Okay, so on the demand side, there are generically speaking two kinds of options. You can either replace inefficient technologies with more efficient technologies, or you can change operating practices, that is behavior. Uh, for the utilities, there are some things that they can do on their side. Uh, every utility has underground pipes and in many cases they're decades old and they leak. So one thing that utilities have to do is uh, an ongoing program of distribution system leak detection and repair. It's not a trivial thing to do, again, because they're underground, but they're technologies that keep improving to uh, both identify and repair the leaks without digging up all, all the pipes. Another option that I think is really important is uh, having seasonal rates and an inclining block rate structure. By seasonal, I mean you would charge more for water in the summer when it's scarce and less for water in the winter when it's abundant. An inclining block rate would mean that the price you pay for water, dollar per acre foot or dollar per cubic foot, would go up the more you use. So you'd set one level fairly low to cover basic indoor household water use. If you wanted to have a lawn or a garden, you'd have to pay a higher rate for that incremental use. And if you wanted to waste water by washing your car or running a swimming pool or just being sloppy, you'd pay an even higher rate. Interestingly, Ferndale and Linden do have inclining block rate structures. And Bellingham, which I like to think of as a very environmentally uh, friendly city, does not. Uh, we have a flat rate for a water. Hopefully, um, Bellingham will soon uh, change its mind. Again, agriculture is really key, and there are three things you can do there. One is change of technologies. The other is better schedule irrigation, which I think is the most uh, appealing because it's very inexpensive. And the third is to better uh, maintain irrigation equipment. So if you drive out in the county, you'll see lots of these uh, big gun systems. Uh, and they're beautiful to look at because they spray this huge jet of water, and it's really dramatic. But it's also very wasteful because this uh, big stream of water, a lot of that's getting evaporated. It doesn't even reach the ground, let alone the plant. Also, if it's windy, if say the wind's blowing like this, over here you're going to have too much water on your field, and over here you're not going to have enough. So an alternative is to have drip irrigation, where you have these little plastic tubes that sit right on the ground. Sometimes they're actually buried, and they're right next to the plant. So you have almost no evaporative loss. And you don't have much runoff because you're just putting in small amounts of water right by the roots of the plant. So this kind of system is, is much more efficient. I think we should have, have more of that. At, at the residential level, there are other thing, things you can do. This is a timer. It costs about $10. You can get it at any hardware store, Lowe's, or uh, Home Depot. And like most of us, I tend to forget it. You know, I got in the morning, I'll turn on the sprinkler. But with this, I'll set this, set this uh, timer for two hours, and then it automatically turns out, turns off. So even if I don't remember for a few hours, I'm not wasting any water. 
Unfortunately, there are obstacles to water use efficiency. Uh, either water prices are low, and I'll come to that in a minute, or if you're a farmer or you're a rural household, you're not paying anything for water. You're paying the operating costs for your electric pump or your diesel pump, but you're not really directly paying for water. As I've mentioned a couple of times, we lack data on actual water use. Uh, a big problem, I think, is tradition, that we just we tend to look at water and view it as inexhaustible. We just don't pay any attention to it. We're concerned about our cable TV bill and our cell phone bill and our electric bill and our natural gas bill, but we don't pay any attention to our water bill, even though we should. Water is a lot more important. And then there's some uh, complications in state water law, which I'll come back to in a minute. And a point I make over and over is lack of institutional support. No one really seems to care. I mean, every utility in the state is required to run a water use efficiency program, but the requirements are very weak. And other than Bellingham, which actually has a fairly good program, the other utilities in the county provide information and information only. They don't really provide any incentives to use water more efficiently. I talked about the lack of, of data on price. If you go to a grocery store and buy bottled water, you're going to pay about $7 a gallon. If you are a customer of the city of Bellingham and you use one additional gallon of water, you're bill is going to charge you an extra point oh oh three dollars per gallon. So what is water worth? How much should we be willing to pay to either conserve water or to provide more water? Should it be seven dollars a gallon or point oh oh three dollars per gallon? Um, it's a huge, huge range. Uh, I see Joel Swisher there. I'm thinking about the uh, years I worked in the electricity sector. And there, there were different ways of determining cost effectiveness, depending on whether you talked about average cost, marginal cost, short run versus long run cost, cost at the point of view of the end use customer or at the producer. But roughly the range would be maybe a factor of two or three, no more than that, uh, compare that with this. I mentioned state water law, which is complicated and it's 100 years old and it makes no sense today. Uh, first of all, the water in Washington, I think throughout the West, is owned by the people. You can't own it as an individual. You, in a sense, can borrow it from the state. The State Department of Ecology acts on behalf of the citizens in its management and regulation of water rights. We have a system of prior appropriation, which means the people who were here first, who were using the water first, they have the most seniority. They have the best rights to uh, water. I see four problems with... Uh, the way we manage water rights in Washington State. First of all, they're free. So here's a resource that is, I think, incredibly important and scarce and going to get more and more scarce, and we give it away. Secondly, that right is permanent. It lasts forever. Third, it's a fixed quantity. You are allocated so many acre feet a year, even though, as I showed before on that stream flow uh, metric, uh, there's enormous variation from year to year, depending on how much snow we have in the winter and how much it rains. And then, as I just mentioned, there's a seniority system so that some users are allowed to have more rights to water than, than others. Uh, unfortunately, there is no appetite for uh, updating state water law. And then further, comp oh, I'm going to skip that for a minute because I want to get to Q&A. Uh, in addition, we have tribal water rights. Uh, the tribes around here signed the 1855 Treaty of Point Elliott which gave them uh, the right to water for two purposes. One on their reservation for their own operations, commercial, industrial, residential, agricultural irrigation, and a much larger implicit right to water in the streams so that they would have enough fish uh, to meet their subsistence, cultural, and commercial needs. So these are the most important and most senior water rights uh, since they date to time immemorial. So they predate, predate any of the uh, water rights that we white folk uh, might have. Unfortunately, we don't know how big the rights are that accrue to the Nooksack Indian tribe or the Lummi uh, Nation. Uh, in the mid-2000s, there were negotiations here on uh, Bertrand Creek in the Middle Fork. They were secret uh, or they're confidential and they failed. And people like me, the public in general, doesn't know why they failed, so we don't know what would need to change to uh, make the negotiations successful. In 2011, uh, the two tribes formally requested the uh, Federal Department of the Interior to come into Whatcom County 
and uh, quantify their water rights. And there was some informal response from the federal government, but nothing formal. So nothing's been done. I can't imagine that the Trump administration has any interest in helping out the tribes. So I don't think anything is going to happen. About three years ago, uh, Jeremy Fryman from the Lummi Nation began negotiations informally with the farmers, with the State Department of Ecology and others to try and resolve these issues. Unfortunately, he died a couple of years ago. And as far as I can tell, those negotiations have not really picked up again since then. So we have this huge water right hanging out there, but nobody really knows how big it is, uh, which further complicates things. You know, for a very positive guy, I'm awfully pessimistic. N another problem, um, dating back to the 1985 ecology rule, a lot of farmers were using water then for which they didn't have permits. And ecology in 85 kind of informally said to the farmers, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. Well, they never did. So we have a huge amount of water being used in the agricultural sector here that is, to put it baldly, illegal. Uh, something like 19,000 acres are irrigated without ecology approval. It's almost 40% of the total. And that amounts to about 30,000 acre feet of water, 44% of the total. I don't blame the farmers for this. I think they're victims of circumstances. But no one is willing to step up to the plate and say, look, this is a problem. It's been around for over 30 years. We've got to get together and solve the problem. And I think it would be feasible to do that because we have now six watershed improvement districts in the county. These are farmer owned and operated government entities that could come together and solve the problem. The reason I say that is within each of the six WIDs, the amount of water rights in existence exceeds the amount that is used with permits plus the amount used without permits. So if farmers who had excess water rights could sell, lease, lend, whatever their excess water right to other farmers, things would be in balance. It would require some changes in state law, it would require permission from ecology, and as far as I can tell, not one of the woods is willing to step up to the plate and take that kind of a risk. So I keep mentioning um, the lack of institutional leadership. Uh, it's not because there are insufficient uh, government entities involved. There are lots involved. The city of Bellingham, uh, Whatcom County, the two Indian tribes, the Nooksacks and the Lummi, Public Utility District Number 1, and the State Department of Ecology. The problem, in my view, is that no one's in charge. This charge, which I know you can't read, but even if you could read it, it wouldn't make any sense at all, is called, and I love this, it's a 2016 interlocal agreement, clarifications. That's what I love, the clarifications. Well, I defy you to look at this chart and figure out who is responsible for what. Because it seems like everybody's got their finger in the pie, but as a consequence, no one can actually make sure that things get done or that plans get integrated, that there's actually some coordinated efforts so that what the city of Bellingham does fits in with what the public utility district is doing, fits in with what ecology is doing. They all kind of operate in silos. Yes, there are entities that come together like the planning unit and the watershed management board where they discuss these things, but again, there's nothing that drives a decision. So let me summarize my uh, cheerful, upbeat, optimistic talk. Whatcom County, in my view, has uh, serious water quantity problems. And to me, the biggest demonstration of that is the precipitous decline in uh, salmon populations over the past few decades. We need to reverse these trends and uh, restore salmon and other wildlife populations and meet tribal treaty obligations. The stream flows set by ecology in 1985 are not met primarily in the summer. Flows are too low and human water use is too high. Uh, there are data gaps. Unfortunately, there is no real incentive to take action. Even though I think pretty much anybody who knows anything about water knows that the current situation, the status quo is unsustainable, uh, people are fearful. They're not sure how the changes might occur and whether it would make them worse. So there's a lot of implicit resistance. Uh, if you want uh, to attend meetings that are really dysfunctional, I invite you to go to the monthly meetings of the WIRA 1 planning unit. They're two-hour meeting exercises in uh, dysfunction. Uh, but it's hard to tell on the surface. Everybody's very friendly to everybody else. Everybody makes statements that on the surface seem reasonable, but at the end of the day, absolutely nothing gets done. And I don't think that's by mistake. I think that's intentional for some parties. I would really love it if the county stepped up and, and took leadership. I think it could make an enormous difference. I also think it's really important because water is life. It is essential for all life, human, um, plants, animals. Uh, 
We can't pretend any longer that water is free and inexhaustible. And I am done.